You're listening to the Farmer's Guardian podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Farmer's Guardian podcast with me, Emily Ashworth, Farmer's Guardian's online editor. This week I speak to Tom Heap, who is widely known for his appearances on BBC Countryfile, The Climate Show and Rare Earth, and he has a passion for the natural world and the countryside. His latest book, Land Smart, explores how various people in the wider agricultural industry can manage the land differently to create balance between nature and food production, whether that is regen practices or introducing more technology. It really isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. I really hope you enjoy the episode and actually, it would be really good to hear your thoughts on our conversation. So let me know what you think and enjoy. So Tom, it's absolutely fantastic to have you on the podcast today. We are here to talk about your new book, Land Smart. But before we get into that, could we actually take a moment to look back maybe? And, you know, could you give us a brief overview of your media work and how that's kind of aligned with your passions? Oh, well, lovely to talk to you. Um, Yes, I can, of course. Uh, So uh, my media work really, well, the last 25 years has been in environment, rural affairs, farming, science, things like that. And it aligned with my passions. I think as a, as a kid, I was always interested in the outdoors. My degree was, geog- was geography. My father was first a, a polar explorer of sorts and then a sort of polar diplomat. So he always had an interest in this relationship between humanity and the natural world. And I think that brushed off on, on me. And so although my early start in journalism was in broad journalism, I find myself gravitating towards the areas that, uh, that I mentioned as uh, science and environment correspondent, uh, rural affairs correspondent, and at the same time beginning to do longer form work on programs like Country File on BBC One and Costing the Earth on Radio 4. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how it's all, all come together really. And I mean, I just love it because, you know, interesting places, uh, often, well, often beautiful places, interesting people I get to talk to. And I've always liked the filming side of my work as well. And it's, you know, just fantastic to be out in the natural world trying to capture that uh, beauty some of the time uh, and the peril at other times. And just before we move on to talk about um, your new book, do you actually feel in a position, you know, for example, if we look at um, our jobs in farming and for a farming publication, you know, we do a lot of kind of um, consumer work as well. So actually being able to play a really small role in telling this sector's story to those outside of it, is that something that you enjoy? Yes, it is, because, you know, there is still, there's no doubt about it, a little bit of a uh, a gulf in knowledge, uh, possibly a gulf in empathy between some of those who who live and work in, in towns or I don't and cities, and actually, even in the countryside, some people are fairly ignorant of what farmers actually do. Um, and and in a sense, uh, I'm not blaming anybody for that, but I think it's really, really nice to be able to shed a bit of light. I mean, I've always said the the journalism I like best is you know tell me something I didn't know and tell me tell me in a you know an entertaining and engaging way. And I, I think there's a lot of scope for that in the the farming and rural space. And I've always been very proud of the work that uh, we've been doing on Countryfile over the years, which whilst the programme is largely celebratory of what's happening in rural Britain, you know, the bits that I'm involved in certainly don't ignore the anguish and the the perils and the challenges. And um, I think that's really important because like any part of our country, both are there, both both, both beauty and uh, and hazard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that leads me on quite nicely, actually, because, you know, there is um or well, two things it's you know th- there's a lot of change going on I mean your new book Lance Mark came out last week on general election day didn't it so yes, it did. in the in the past week there's been a- a immense change and there's going to be you know change coming again but it's also quite um it's, it's all you know it's, it's it's exciting because there's a lot of new opportunities coming um and in that whole sort of environment space and regen space um it it it's going to provide a lot of people with new ways of thinking and new ways of doing things. Um, so mm-hmm. I think that's quite an exciting prospect. Um, Land Smart, your book, How to Give People and Nature the Space to Thrive. You obviously talk to all sorts of, of people in this book, farmers, scientists, conservationists. What was the inspiration? 
The inspiration for the book was a growing awareness that people are asking land, not just in Britain, but globally, to do so many things, not just grow food and provide us a home, but now um, capture and store carbon, generate energy, create materials, obviously provide a space for wildlife, um, maybe hold back flood water, provide recreation, space for mental health, and so on and so on. And you'll be aware of the line, you know, there's only, we've only got one planet. Um, and I was really intrigued to know if there were ways, if we used our land smartly, that we could find ways of enabling both nature and people to thrive. So that was the kind of springboard for it. And then I was thinking, well, although this is a global subject, it's a bit hubristic and it would probably be a massive book if I tried to include the whole world's land use in this. So it is predominantly about the UK, but very much in a global context. And the one thing I really want to get across, which I think distinguishes it from a lot of books about, well, broadly in the environmental space, is I am very respectful and impressed by farmers who produce a lot of food. Now, the reason for that is the worst thing we can do for both our climate and nature around the world is take more virgin land under the plow or under the cow. So in and of itself, producing a lot of food from a small area is a good thing. But I'm aware also that the current way that we do that largely involving a lot of chemicals, uh, both uh, uh, fertilizers and pesticides has a lot of collateral damage as well. And so, you know, uh, one of the things I was sort of talked about in this book is although it's called intensive agriculture, in some senses, given that its impact is global in terms of climate change and can certainly be regional in terms of water pollution, a lot of the way we do uh, intensive agriculture today is, is not that intensive because it's actually it spreads across a wide area. Its impact spreads across a wide area. But I wanted to see, to go and meet people who were doing agriculture with less chemicals in a way that was, in the end, sustainable because it wasn't creating a lot of collateral damage for the planet, but still produced a lot of food. I wasn't really interested in going to sort of parkland organics um, because... You know, I, I just don't think in the end that that's a, a viable solution, really. I mean, there, you know, there are places for it. And I can come on to later, you know, I, there are chapters about rewilding because there, are, there is a, the stuff about nature. But one of that, that's one of the things I, I really tried to put at the core of the book was how we can balance enough food with giving space for nature. And that's really tricky, but some really and smart people are doing it. And just to finish this rather long answer, when you come to balancing priorities, balancing different new uses of our land, that's where the smart bit comes in. That's where you have to be really smart when, you're, when you've are when you got two com slightly competing things. Uh, that's when the, 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 the real brains uh, appear. So in terms of, um, you know, the farmers that you actually met, what, what specifically can uh, farmers in our sector perhaps take away from it? Because I know that there's chapters specifically on um, arable farmers and livestock farmers. What, what is it that they were doing that was um, that was interesting to you? What they were doing that was interesting to me, well, I'll start, I'll start with the Arab. And I really focus on, well, I sort of focus on, there's quite a lot of that Arab, actually, now I think about it, because it's really important in terms of food. Um, so uh, I, I went to see a, a farmer called Rod Smith up in Northumberland, who is known in farming circles because at one time he held the record yield uh, for wheat. And so, you know, I wanted to, to, to see him and see, I mean, brutally, you know, was he just a chemical junkie? Uh, were they all, you know, drowning in nitrogen uh, or rather thriving in nitrogen, I should say. Um, uh, and, and what was really interesting was actually, you know, he is on a journey to deliver more from his soils. And so he is working really hard on his soils. He knows that, I mean, he hasn't, he hasn't dropped the, the chemicals completely at all. In fact, he's still uses more than some others, but he's on the journey. His respect for the soil, his love of worms, his amazing compost and windrows and other things he has, he, you know, he's really loving. He's really getting a kick out of these things. And I was just interested to, to hear from him 
someone who really believes in yield so much that he was in the Guinness Book of Records, to realise that folks like him are realising they have to change as well whilst doing their best to maintain the yield because that in the end helps to feed the world. Uh, then I went to see uh, a chap called Tim Parton, who is, if you like, further down the, uh, uh, further along, I should say, the road of being more regenerative. He's extremely into various sort of compost teas and foliar fertilizers and things like that. And he's got his nitrogen per hectare down to around uh, 50 kilograms when your, I'm sure your readers will be aware it's often around, you know, 200, but he's reduced it hugely without reducing his yield. And also, without harming the potential of the fields to grow food in the future. <laughs> and that's, you know, that, that's the really important thing. And while I'm on that, the, one of the hardest questions in this space is what we do with peatland farming, because it is simultaneously one of our best food producers and one of our biggest causes of climate change in terms of the quite simply um, disappearing peat, you know, oxidizing peat. And it is quite frightening. It's often, it's often said that we can't really see the effects of climate change. When you go to some of these farms and see how the land level has dropped, you know, <laughs> and that stuff, you know, what used to be land to grow our food is now in the atmosphere warming the planet. That is quite stark. And yet, you know, the, the, uh, there are some really interesting balancing acts being done there. And there's ideas that maybe we could re-wet a lot of the peat and, and farm the top. You know, the big company G's Fresh are, are doing a lot in this space to kind of see if we can um, reduce our, um, uh, reduce the emissions from those fields without stopping farming altogether. Um, and then I went to talk to, to uh, a, a chap called uh, James Brown, who um, has a farm in Lincolnshire. And um, he, he's basically going even further. He's, the idea is he's going to re-wet his fields, grow willow, put them into pyrolysis, capture the carbon and use the heat from a pyrolysis plant in a, um, in a polytunnel. So there are some people doing some really, this is what I mean by smart, you know, some people doing some really clever things. What I hope you got from this is the book is very, very far from fundamentalist. The idea is that it, you know, it's outcomes driven. It's what works. Uh, and and admiring the people who are finding ways of making it work. Yeah. Oh, I didn't do livestock. Sorry, <laughs> livestock. <laughs> um, but livestock, um, I I went to to Wales and talked to uh, a couple there, Rachel and Grant, uh, Medley Davis, who who are in the um, Snowdonia National Park. They're not sort of total upland farmers. They're sort of mixed between the rolling land and a bit of the upland. And really, there and and all of these. Uh, you know, a lot of these things won't, won't be entirely new to many of your readership. You know, it's it's about thinking about the pasture, about plant, planting clover and sandpoint and things like this, which store carbon um, in the soil, uh, create a more varied diet for the animals so it grows a bit quicker. So a lot of it isn't about the number of sheep. It's about the, the kilogrammage of lamb. It's also about, you know, being rigorously measuring the yield of different parts of their farm and the bits that aren't yielding very well, um, putting, the, putting them back to nature. Um, and uh, because they're frankly not, not delivering sufficiently. And they were absolutely confident that they hadn't re reduced the um, yield of food from their farm, whilst at the same time they had increased um, nature dramatically. And I think I think we do have big questions for the uplands because I do look at some parts of the uplands and I know this is going to make me unpopular with some of your uh, some of your listeners. Some of the uplands, it seems to me, are not doing a lot with the land. What I mean is they're not producing a lot of food. They're not producing a lot of wildlife. They're not producing a lot of energy. They're not producing a lot of water storage they're not, to my mind, a very effective land use at the moment. So I do think we need to expand the areas of uh, nature in a lot of our uplands. I do think we need to start thinking possibly, yeah, well, and that would be rewilding some of them. I do think we need to look at more uh, energy generation, be that uh, turbines or possibly solar panels and things in, in parts of our uplands. 
and really thinking, you know, is this land working well? Is it doing much? You know, what is it doing? Is it doing it well? Because I think if you ask that question to a lot of uh, upland areas, the answer is sadly no at the moment. Just let's flip that for a second then, because just going off what I mentioned before about kind of, um, well, we talked about that circular kind of approach where it's, you know, us in farming and then perhaps other parts of society tweaking as well. Do you think um, this style, shall I call it a style, this way of farming um, with a nature focus, an environment focus, a regen focus, do you think that's a way to kind of rally consumer um, support? Because interestingly as well, I got some research through this morning um, and to be fair, it wasn't just kind of UK based, it was uh, European data, but it said that consumers believe that regen produce or uh, food produced in land with nature is much more healthier okay <laughs> so do you do you think I, I i've asked for some deep dive into those to those stats i haven't got a, a reply yet but i just wonder whether you think that you know if we told more of these stories about what we are actually doing on farm to mitigate climate change etc is that a way in to consumers i think I, I think it is. You, you, the, the reason for the note of, of pausing in my voice is that we've seen that, well, the consumers are not a homogenous unit. There is definitely a, a proportion of them for whom this stuff really matters. But as, um, you know, has often been proven in the, in surveys, you know, they, consumers say they care about the welfare of pork and then they go in and buy the cheapest bacon in the supermarket, you know, and, 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 and that, uh, whilst that is a bit of a cliche, that there's some truth in it. And uh, I think especially at a time of when people, certainly in the last couple of years, have been very worried about the cost of food. I think that could um, be the, still be the, the, the main thing that dictates their behaviour. Having said that, um, I mean, I, I think it is plausible that uh, regener food uh, produced in a more regen agricultural system is more healthy. Um, I know um, the likes of Andy Cater and Wild Farms and things would definitely claim that's the case. I, I haven't seen the sort of hard and fast research on that, so I wouldn't be able to say. But I think it tells a better story about farming altogether. That's that's what I really think does matter, that people are broadly worried that farming might be on the wrong side of this argument. You know, every other year we have, you know, the Farmland Bird Index or the State of Nature Report, and usually on the naughty step is farming, particularly intensive farming. So there is an impression that this uh, profession is not helping, that is making it worse. And I think in, in, in too often that's been true in the last few decades. I think there is a real opportunity to get on the right side of that argument. And I think there are ways of doing it, which, and this is the most important thing, don't result in, ex in us reducing massively our food production here and demanding that the rest of the world produces our food because there is no planetary gain in having beautiful parkland here and pushing our food imports to the rest of the world under who knows what environmental production credentials. I'm quite interested to see what the next step after, um, I don't know if you saw the story about the Danish government putting the carbon tax on agriculture. I did, yes, I did see that. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, I think these are really interesting things to, to discuss. Um, and that was one of the things that actually comes up at the end of the Pete chapter in my book. You know, if you had a carbon tax on agriculture, like we have carbon taxes in other parts of industry, particularly those that are high emitters, you know, that then begins to drive behaviours. And that could be that could be something really interesting to explore. Um, I, I think there is something slightly underlying all this is uh, if you put these extra costs on the production of food, then you put up the price of food. Now, I'm someone who doesn't necessarily think, well, I, I'm someone who thinks we need to have a debate about the price of food and that um, uh, cheap food is not an altar on which I worship. Now, I'm lucky enough to not be on the breadline, uh, but I think that this idea that we can have ever cheaper food is damaging for farming, it's damaging for the environment, and in the end, it's damaging for people's health as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a whole other podcast, eh, Tom? (laughs) (laughs) So just to finish up, what was the either the biggest thing or the most kind of takeaway point that throughout this whole process of of collating these stories and this research for for Landsmart that you came away with? Okay. I, I, I always struggle with a single thing, so I'm going to give you a, sh- a short handful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've mentioned one of them already. Multifunction your land when you can. Yeah. Stack different land uses one upon another. Um, one which is going to be controversial, which I probably should have mentioned earlier. If you want to make energy from your land, put either panels, solar panels, or a wind turbine on it. And I'm going to talk briefly about the solar panels because, sorry, put solar panels or a wind turbine on it, don't plant biofuels. In my, in my view, biofuels, plants that grow are grown to be burnt, usually in diesel or petrol, um, or bioethanol, I should say, are, in my view, a pretty dumb use of land. And this is because their energy output per unit area is a tiny fraction of what you get from solar. Now, it's difficult to measure the energy per unit area of a wind turbine because it slightly depends how you measure it, but broadly the same is true. But just focusing on solar, solar, it, it depends how you measure it, depends where you are in the world, uh, but it is f- 50 to 300 times more productive of energy per unit area than any biofuel. And I think that's really significant. And, and people think small, and, and just to give you an idea of this, the area of solar panels on my house, which is the standard four kilowatt array, which is sort of what people are allowed to get. You know, that's enough to power an electric car. That, sorry, that's enough to power two electric cars for their annual mileage in Britain. So the, what I'm saying is the annual mileage and average mileage in Britain is about seven and a half thousand miles, and it produces enough energy to do 15,000 miles. Now, and, it, you know, it, it takes an area of a fraction of a tennis court, you know, probably about a quarter. I haven't quite worked it out. But it, it's like all about two commercial parking spaces. You know, the idea that you could power a car from two commercial parking spaces of wheat or rapeseed oil is absurd. Um, so, if you, sorry, I went rather long, but if you want to, <laughs> simple, coming back to where I started, if you want to produce energy from your land, put panels there or a turbine. And if you ever want to build a a distribution warehouse, put panels on the top of it. It is almost a crime that less, fewer than 5% of our massive warehouses have solar panels on the top. That is an outrage in my view. Um, And in the view of the woman who runs the UK Warehouse Association, by the way. Um, So that was, um, so stack where you can, uh, energy where you can, um, and yeah, I think, and, and respect the yield. Uh, that's, you know, and, and try and do your best to get a lot of food off a of small space uh, because that's, that matters. I, I, I use the, uh, you probably remember the Dimbleby report, the food strategy thing that came out uh, a while ago. That just, that the only illustration of the book is that, you know, he produced that map of Britain that showed, you know, um, what proportion of land we use for different things. And then it had an offshore island that was <laughs> the amount of land we demand for the rest of the world in order to uh, to satisfy our uh, our demand for food, our diets. You know, we must not increase the size of that offshore island. Uh, that's just irresponsible, really. I, I mentioned behavioural change in the yeah. book because I don't think, you know, we have to see this in, in the context of diet as well. And, um, uh, yeah. So I I think we need to look at wasting less, eating less overall, putting putting less crop into biofuels, mentioned that already. And yes, eating less meat has to come in there as well because because of the the sort of efficiency conversion factor. Um, Meat is is land hungry. I think everyone knows that. Um, And so I'm, I'm I'm not a vegetarian and I do not, um, if people want to be, that's fine, but I, I'm not expecting uh, people to be. But I do think we need to look at uh, eating, we need to investigate eating less milk. Just out of 
interest before you head off, Tom. Do you think are you are you interested in how we sort of like one of my biggest things and something that we are planning to do quite big here at FG is um get some sort of education, I don't know how that looks, but into school environments. Mm, very. Yeah, very, very how... interested. I, sorry, I've just you, you've actually reminded me of one of the other I think absolutely poor things in the book. So forgive me <laughs> while I just quickly delve into that. Um, one of the things I, you know, it is called Land Smart, and one of the things that I, I, it's in the conclusion of the book, is that we need to give more respect to land-based skills and land-based knowledge, and all that. I mean, I'm of an age and era when people were a bit sniffy about, oh, they've gone off to do land economy, and you know, it, it, you know, it's that sort of. Uh, academic arrogance um, that that is that is prevalent, you know, and we need to you know, really uh, admire, encourage, fund skills in this area because this is really tough stuff. It's really challenging. People are doing amazing things, and uh, you know, I, I, I end with yeah, with a, with a sort of plea that this stuff needs to be given its its prominence and respect in agricultural and research circles because, yeah, in well, my view, it's, it's well saving. Absolutely. And also the other side is how many opportunities there are in terms of, you know, when you look at what uh, skills are required and the interest that we can peak in people in terms of, you know, soil health or climate change or, you know, that, that science, that science core base to this, you know, that's, that's, huge for attracting new people into the industry so yeah i couldn't agree more with that absolutely sorry i interrupted you slightly you were talking about something about school was there something that you wanted to ask me there no no i just wondered because you know we've we this sort of conversation i guess has been going on for a while hasn't it in terms of how we actually get this sort of well get this topic into schools and in what format should it be its own sort of subject should it be taught across other subjects i just wondered what your thoughts were basically on how we can actively kind of go forwards and make something like that happen because it's like you were just saying about giving this sort this you know respect I, I don't quite understand where that comes from when you can go and do so many other vocational courses and that sort of thing and this I don't know it's just never it's never part of the conversation in schools ever no I well I think you're right I <laughs> I'm prepared to be hubristic and comment on a few things that I don't get, but I probably ought to be careful about education because I'm just, it's just not my area of expertise. I mean, I think I think role models are good, and you know, the likes of, of Adam Henson and and, and um, Jeremy Clarkson in this space are, are are probably good, and we have seen a bit of a rise with social media in in roles of um, of greater diversity in that space as well, and I think that that that's really important. I think some of it does have to come from the top. I think some of it has to come from government. You know, I, I've talked to farmers before who say, you know, politicians absolutely love to, you know, don a hard hat and a high vis jacket and go around something either, you know, heavy metal that makes them look roughy tufty or something, you know, computery that, you know, so they can get off on on AI. Um, which, you know, in our world, AI means artificial insemination or possibly avian influenza. <laughs> it does not mean artificial intelligence. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, you know, I'd like to see more more politicians embr embracing that side of AI. Um, yeah. <laughs> as someone was saying, they, they they don't do it because you know, it, I don't I don't quite know why, but it you know, it hasn't it needs to be given this kind of centrality, this kind of prominence uh, in, in order, and and, and and yeah, politicians and those do have a role to play in this because. And I, and I think partly it's to say it, it's not coming along and saying we've got all the answers. It's coming along and saying, and this I hope is what, what the book does as well, is saying this is really important. There are some answers out there. Here's some best practice. Let's see what we can learn from those because we need to get this stuff right. And, and you know, I, I think that's a sort of approach that the that, that politics could have. And also it sort of gets you out of the silo of, um, you know, some farmers saying, oh, you're all just about Tweety Birds and you don't give a damn about food or, 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 or vice versa, which is, you know, which is just a kind of sterile, sterile argument. That was my conversation with Tom Heap, all about his new book, Land Smart. As I mentioned in the introduction, I really would love to hear your thoughts because obviously this is quite a big conversation right now about how we can produce food alongside 
balancing environmental practices and nature. You can also check out Tom's special Farming Matters column in the Farmer's Guardian magazine next week, so don't forget to pick up a copy. But that's it from me this week. We'll be back again with another Farmer's Guardian podcast episode next week. So in the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favourite platform. Oh,